It's 1.30. I'd like to call the February 18th, 2013 meeting of the Traffic and Transportation Commission to order. Can I have roll call, please? Commissioner Witcher? Here, sir. Commissioner Littlefield? Here, sir. Commissioner Newton? Here, sir. Commissioner Hale? Here, sir. Commissioner Shuline? Here. Commissioner Jenkins? She was in the back. I think she'll be here in just a minute. Uh, Commissioner George? Yes. Here, sir. And, and Commissioner Yonkel? Here. Oh, there's Commissioner Jenkins. Are you here? I'm here. She's here. <laughs> Let the record show everybody's here. Uh, may I have a motion concerning approval of the minutes of the January 25th, 2013 meeting, please? Motion to approve minutes. We have a motion to approve from Commissioner uh, Newton. Second. And we have a second from Commissioner Hale. We have any talk on the meeting minutes? Okay, we have a motion to approve the meeting minutes from Commissioner Newton and a second from Commissioner Hale. May I have your votes, please? My item is almost approved. There it is. All right. The report on license and taxis will occur in April. There's no items on the consent docket. First item for consideration, item 5A, Carol Kincaid, Lake Ridge Homeowners Association, P.O. Box 892334, Oklahoma City, Oklahoma, to consider request to change the speed limits on South May Avenue between Southwest 89th Street and Southwest 134th Street, which is also State Highway 37, from 45 miles per hour to 40 miles per hour and Item two, change the speed limit on Southwest 104th Street between South Pennsylvania Avenue and South Portland Avenue from 45 miles per hour to 40 miles per hour. Do we have anybody here to speak on this one? Hi, if you could come up and state your name and your address and please remember you have up to five minutes to talk. Thank you, ma'am. Commissioners, uh, my name is Carol Kincaid. My address is uh, 11004 South Brookline Avenue. I'm the president of the Lake Ridge Homeowners Association. And we are here today to request your consideration to re lower the speed limits on South May Avenue between Southwest 89th and Southwest 134th and on Southwest 104th Street from South Penn over to South Portland. Uh, in, re in reviewing the material that uh, Mr. Chai sent me, I noticed that 30 accidents have occurred in that two-mile stretch between Penn and Portland. Uh, while 50% of them did not uh, did occur at the signalized intersections, that means 50% or 15 accidents occurred at other places along that two-mile stretch of road, and that was in the 2012 uh, information. Likewise, on uh, South May from 89th and to 134th, while there were 28 accidents total, uh, this one is a little bit different. Only nine occurred not at the signalized intersections, but that is still 32% uh, of that uh, accident rate. Also, uh, one thing that in the documentation that you should have before you also, on page three, it does mention that on 119th Street, that the speed limit between uh, South May Avenue and South Penn Avenue uh, is 40 miles per hour. It is also 40 miles an hour just recently changed between South Penn and uh, Southwestern. In fact, it extends all the way over to uh, South Santa Fe. One of the, our concerns is that things have changed greatly in our part of town since, well, actually since we moved there, it was mostly pasture back in 19, uh, 95, 96, 97, and that we are just having more and more population move into this area, including uh, there is a 150-unit apartment complex that was just approved by the City Council in December, and groundbreaking will begin on that shortly. I don't know what their timeline is for completing that, but additional uh, commercial businesses will be associated on the parcels uh, in front of that, and that will be uh, near the intersection Southwest 104th and South May Avenue. Uh, many of you may be familiar with that area across the street from the new Crest Fresh Food Store. And that's going to add additional traffic to that particular area. 
and I might point out that there are no traffic lights in between any of the major mile corners on any of these that we're requesting. So it's not as if uh, speeding traffic can be slowed because there is a, an intersecting uh, side street that has a light. There are no lights, it's a straight shot, basically from 89th to 104th, 104th to 119th, and 119th to 134th, and likewise on 104th on the two miles covered there. Uh, people trying to cross to Early Wine Park, it's a take your chance and hope you can run fast enough to get a street uh, across the street because there are no pedestrian crosswalks, no flashing lights of any sort. We do not have sidewalks uh, in that area, uh, especially there on May Avenue between 104th and 119th. It's only by the Crest Foods. And under the new requirements of building, there will be some sidewalks there, but we just don't have any by our additions. And of course, walkers, joggers, bicyclists, who are using uh, that area trying to go to the lovely park with the walking trails and so forth are basically, with, I'd like to tell you that they walk on the grass, but a lot of times they're out in the street. And uh, South May is a, is a busy street. So those are our main concerns, and I'm happy to answer any questions you might have of me. And I certainly thank you and appreciate your time in hearing our request. And uh, your decision certainly will be uh, respected. One of the concerns that I kind of smiled at in the report that I received was a concern that at some future time someone might uh, come and ask for even a lower speed limit. I, ha I can assure you it won't be me. This is my one time, one shot deal. Thank you so much. Thank you, ma'am. Sir, if I can have the staff input. All right, you've got all our comments before you. Um, I'll just read a little bit out of the report for the benefit of those who don't have it. Um, Current collision experience on both May Avenue and 104th Street in this area don't seem to indicate there are any trends related to, uh, or hazards on these streets related to their current speed limit posting. Um, staff really does not have cause to recommend lowering the speed limits on May or on, or on 104th Street at this point in time. Uh, the requested reductions on the roadways, you know, that you're looking at is five miles an hour below their currently posted limits. And the, the one thing that Ms. Kincaid referred to is when a, when we had written in that it's not unreasonable to expect uh, request for further reductions, I think it's that's more of a comment to rec for indicating that it would not be beyond reasonable to expect more re reductions for from the uh, other streets that are posted at 45, not taking those from you know going at 40 down to 35 or something along that line. Um, in urbanized areas, you know, in Oklahoma City, the use of 40 and 45 mile an hour speed limits on the arterial system is pretty commonplace. Um, Something for your consideration when looking at these things might be the presence of multiple driveways along the arterial systems. You know, that might be something that you take into consideration when you're debating whether or not you think that a, a 40 or 45 may be more appropriate under certain conditions. Um, there are several additions along this stretch also that have got uh, long lines of basically arterial fences, you know, whether they're brick or stockade, and that limits the amount of access points. So the number of conflict points along the arterial is reduced as a result of that. You know, uh, a recent case that uh, we talked about a, a while back was uh, in the case of like Pebblestone Parkway. That's a, that's a street that's posted at 25 miles an hour, but due to the fact that there are so few access points, the roadway is built at a standard where drivers feel more comfortable driving at it at, at you know, higher than its current posted limit is something that all, that tends, for, you know, has, that's why when we've conducted speed studies on this road, Traffic's been moving at a considerable clip fast, you know, above the, uh, the posted 25 on Pebblestone Parkway. But in the case of like May Avenue and Southwest 104th Street, uh, in the absence of any unusual collision trends or anything like that, it's really somewhat, it's kind of at the discretion of com uh, the commission and, you know, based on public input and commentary as to which speed limit may be more appropriate for use on an arterial like this. As Ms. Kincaid alluded to, that, you know, the world has changed in this area. It's become more urbanized, and so there's, you know, there are more driveways present than there had been in the past. It's not like it's more in a rural area where it's kind of a pass-through area along, you know, where people are traveling into the city and they haven't come into the urbanized limits. These these roads have pretty much been built up. So, action on this matter will be uh, at the discretion of the commission. Thank you, sir. May I have a motion concerning item 5A, please?
Make a motion to approve. We have a motion from Commissioner Hale to approve item 5A. Do we have a second? I'll second. And we have a second from Commissioner Witcher. Do we have any talk on this item? I have a question for, for Stuart. Um, when you say that there, there are no trends, um, and that I didn't catch what the reporting period that you're looking at is. So there are no, since the area has been built up, say, the last five years, there's no trends? Is, is that a fair statement? I'm sorry. Um, if you look, look on the screens and back behind me, we've got a, uh, a display of the collision history along some of these roads. And if you look at some of the intersections, you'll see that some vary in collisions between like, you know, like just, uh, for example, at, um, at Fountain Drive, Fountain Boulevard in 2010, 2011, there weren't any collisions at that intersection. And then in 2012, there was, there was one. Um, other intersections don't seem to have any collisions at all. The, the big collision getter in this entire corridor, or actually on these two streets, is where, the, is where 104th Street intersects with May Avenue. And you know that's not unreasonable to expect. It's not. It's not an unreason, It's not a uh, unrealist, unreasonable high number of collisions. But when you get um, two intersecting arterials that are relatively busy, you know the potential for collisions goes up because there are just more opportunities for them. And that that kind of gets to a follow-up question. That 30 still, even if there's no trends, 30 accidents sounds like a lot uh, to me. Just thinking about. Um, if I were in an accident, you know, I'd... <laughs> That's where you want Well, yeah. That's, well, yeah. But the, I guess uh, for similar um, arterial intersections and, and similar arterials, is that a high number or average, or is that a, or is that a fair question? Based that on I would have to, I'd have to do some more looking into something like that. Because uh, the, the most recent intersections we've looked at were uh, what's in response to an article that was published by the Oklahoma, and that was looking at kind of the, the, uh, the top 10 intersections with the most collisions and some of those were well over 100 for, you know, a three-year period. So, you know, there are, there are intersections out there. But, you know, it's, it's all a function of, the, of how they're traveled and basically what the volumes are, the number of turning movements possible, and that sort of thing. But for, for this area, there, the overall trends as far as the, the nature of the collisions go, they're, relative, they're, they're low, which to me would indicate that there are not really any so, you know, has any um, hazards related to speed or site conditions at these intersections. So in this, in these particular corridors, I would not say are unique. They don't have anything that stands out as saying that, you know, there's something that ought to be looked at as far as, you know, this is, this is an action that can be taken to mitigate these collisions because the, the types of collisions that occur are just all over the place. I mean, they're, they're rear end collisions due to inattention. There's, there's side swipes, fixed object collisions. Um, you know, there's, you know, at intersections, it's not uncommon to find, you know, failure to yield, failure to stop, or right angle type collisions. So, I mean, there's, they're widely varied. There, now, there are certain intersections that do have trends, and when when we come across those, we'll do things to mitigate them. I mean, we've done things like we've added um, what's called a near side indicator at an intersection. It's got a traffic signal. It's basically a, a, a signal that stands up on the right side of the road, and it's another advanced form of notification for for some drivers, especially if the road gets fairly wide, and we found that we get some decent crash reductions as a result of that sort of thing, but you know, there aren't that many opportunities to install. That's usually something on an intersection where you know, you've got like over 180 feet or something like that to cross, so you usually find that thing, something like that on like the Northwest Expressway or maybe Shields Boulevard, something along that line. But uh, in this particular area, we don't have any, any trends that just jump out and indicate that there's a particular hazard associated with any one of these intersections. Okay, now? I've got one more. Okay. So lowering the, the with uh, numbers like the 85th percentile being 47 miles an hour and 57 miles an hour, if we lower the speed limit, do we, uh, common sense would tell me that the, the uh, common speeds that people drive would stay the same. We would just be widening the gap. Is that a fair statement? Not necessarily. Okay. Um, because not everyone who drives through an, through an area is already familiar with it. Okay. So, I mean, there are probably drivers that are, that are daily users of this that will probably have a tougher time adjusting to the, the modified speed limit. And you might, but I think that in time that the 85th percentile will probably fall. I mean, it, 
being hopeful that it would come down to 40 miles an hour is probably not realistic, but I tend to think that, you know, right now, since you're at 85th percentiles running near 47 and 50, it'll probably drop down the neighborhood of, I would guess, probably 45 or so, or maybe hopefully less in the future as people adapt. Okay. Yeah. I have a quick question for Mrs. Kincaid. I'm an advocate of the power of one person's voice. So I applaud you being here. Can you give us just a little understanding of, of how many folks you represent, conversations you've had? Because there are going to be people who completely oppose what you're doing. Absolutely. So I just, I just want to get a feel for, for how, you, how broad of an issue this is. Yes, um, in our neighborhood, we're one of the mid-size in this part of town. We have 277 homes. Uh, I have spoken with, I receive emails and phone calls and have for several years uh, from people who are very concerned, particularly about the early wine onto May Avenue uh, entrance. And unfortunately, some of it is centered around a couple of AT&T boxes that uh, Mr. Chai's group came out and measured. And of course, they are literally right on the line of being perfectly legal. Uh, but for us to see for left turns particularly, this has raised citizen concerns. And yes, and all the people that I visited with, I had one person state unequivocally she was totally dead set against lowering the speed limits because she speeds and she doesn't want to pay any tickets to, you know, have this done. And um, I had to chuckle that um, the others, everyone has said, oh, you know, if we can't get a light, if we can't get those boxes moved, that would help. And all we're seeing is more and more development that's coming to our area. And I had to smile a while ago when you mentioned about the fixed item collisions. Those have mostly been our fences uh, or our entrance areas. And we have uh, had numerous uh, run-ins with those and they put big holes in the, the fences. And you kind of wonder, it's a straight street. It's not rainy, icy, whitey hair, is that what they do? And so people, I think, get lulled into, it's a nice straight street. Uh, there's just all that you can say. It's a nice straight street, wide, four lane, wide open. And uh, you know, we, we really appreciate uh, the city working with us, but this is where, you know, and I just do what the majority of the people ask me to do, so. Have you asked for lights and or pedestrian crossings into that park in the past? We inquired about a light and because of the location of where Early Wine is, uh, Early Wine Boulevard is in relationship to where 104th is, we would not meet that criteria. If it were a little farther south, we might. Uh, we were told we could pay $250,000 and get a light uh, put in there like many of the businesses do, but that's not something that our association uh, even if we went together with some of the other associations, we just don't have that kind of, of money uh, to afford a light. Now, as far as a pedestrian crossing, that might be something. Uh, but here again, without the sidewalks, so many people come across from the neighborhoods across the street and then come over to our neighborhood and literally come down our street, Brookline, because we're the first street off of May to go to the park. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. I had a question. Well, just let her finish up. Go ahead, ma'am. And then I had a um, quick question for staff. Stuart, is there, any, is there any science that can be brought to questions like this when there has been an increase of commercial activity, residences, traffic, something that tells us within a 10-year span if traffic has increased by 30%, this is a candidate for speed reduction. I'm just looking for some science to, doesn't mean it would completely guide the subjectivity of this, but just something that would help guide us in the future so it felt a little more consistent. Well, there are studies, I'm sorry, there are studies that are out there and available. Um, for the next meeting, I think under further information, I'll go ahead and provide some of that info because uh, You've seen a lot of reports that come from us that will talk about speed limit reductions in the areas where we've got like new, develops, new developments coming in and they've got uh, locations proposed that will not pass decision site distance. And I mean, you know, there, and it, there, may be, there may be cases where you cannot put, you know, where a developer or a builder may have so much frontage along an arterial road and they just cannot find a location that will pass our site distance criteria based on how the speed limit's posted. 
So the, you know, we'll present cases like that from time to time. Uh, you'll probably see one next month. Um, but as far as how the adjustment of a speed limit should be on like a developed arterial where things like sight distance isn't an issue, I think there's a study that recently came out of Ontario, Canada that was talking about, it's, it's almost a function of um, social behavior, and psychology as much, as much as it is anything else because, you know, driver comfort and driver expectation kind of dictate a lot of, you know, their behavior in traffic. I mean, if an area is particularly hazardous or the roads are seem relatively congested or there may be any other n number of things, that'll cause people to probably go slower than that, what they might otherwise. And if you build a, a long straight road with wide lanes and few interruptions, it, that, that too probably has a tendency to cause people that may not go ordinarily that fast to maybe travel beyond, above the posted limit because it feels more comfortable and natural. So we'll provide some of that information for you at the next meeting. But as far as exact science as to when something like that should occur, I think there's probably as many opinions one way as there are the other on it. Yes, sir. Mrs. Kincaid um, earlier indicated that uh, there was a change between Penn and May on Southwest 119th Street from 45 down to 40, relatively recent. Is there any evidence or information about what that change from 45 down to 40 has done to that street? Has it made any effect whatsoever? Is there something we can use as a basis of compar comparison in this exact area uh, to help understand if lowering the speed limit from 45 to 40 would help? Well, every time we prepare a case, if there was a speed limit lowering in that, I'm just, I don't recall what that one may have been recently. Um, what we could, because every report that we prepare for you basically has existing conditions in it. So it gives us the opportunity to go back and do like a follow-up study if needs be. So we can go, uh, we can see what other, what other uh, speed limit adjustments have occurred in recent history and then do a little, little bit of follow-up on that, finding out, you know, it, you know, if we took a street that was posted at 45 and dropped it to 40, you know, we knew what the before, and before conditions were, we can now give you a snapshot at some point in time after. Because I'm but, concerned also with the psychology of everything, if lowering from 45 to 40 is actually going to do us any good, if we're just actually putting a sign up to put a sign up and the uh, people are not actually going to follow it. I want it to be slower through there, believe me, I do, but if it's not going to do any good, then what's the point? We need to find another, another mechanism to try to get that traffic stalled at some point so people can move a little bit more easily uh, crossing it and uh, and getting into traffic from other driveways and things like that. Right. Yeah, because anything that you do really has to be kind of has to be deemed as reasonable in the in the mind of the public because there are certain streets in the, in the city where the where due to sight distance restrictions, I mean they may have speed limits, you know, four lane arterial may have a speed limit posted down as low as 30 miles an hour. But whether it gets traveled at 30 miles an hour is, uh, is unlikely because, I mean, most people will drive at the speed that they're most comfortable in doing. And if it's in an area where all the, where the predominant limits on the arterials are, say, 40 miles an hour, it's unlikely you're going to get that, that level of um, obeyance of the law because, I mean, it's just, it just goes against human nature. Sir, you had something? Is your main, Ms. Kincaid, is your main concern the intersection of early wine and May? Uh, I would have to say that uh, from our neighborhood's perspective, yes, uh, particularly for the left turn, obviously right's not a problem, uh, although even that is confounded by those AT&T boxes, but uh, 104th and early wine is also uh, an issue because of the big trucks turning in and out of the Crest Foods that are there. Uh, and I might say that we have, uh, I've spoken with the people at Rivendale who uh, are there on 119th in that development and they said they have noticed uh, that it doesn't seem that people are speeding on 119th as extensively as they had previously. I have no scientific basis for saying that other than I do know a lot of people will willingly go five miles over a speed limit but they feel uncomfortable going more than that and so therefore five miles over 45 you've got a 50 mile an hour vehicle coming down the street uh, and you know this is just as I, I love the statement about the human nature that if I feel comfortable doing five miles over and I look at that and I go oh I can do 45 but I don't want to do 50 because I'd be 10 miles over the limit and so that would just be you know one of the cons considerations uh, also I, I do want to mention and he was going to try to be here today but Councilman David Greenwell who is uh, our councilman happens to live in Lake Ridge also and uh, he and I have spoken about this at length and he too has supported uh, this so uh, Planning Commissioner 
uh, Todd Ehlers lives in Lake Ridge as well, and I spoke with him to, to get his uh, input on it, and everybody agrees that we do have a problem, and it's only going to get worse uh, because we're getting the commercial development, and there's, uh, you know, with this 150-unit apartment complex and the parcels that will be put in front of it, we, we know they're coming, and, uh, you know, it's just, it's going to be very crowded in that area. But the reason I'd ask that is I'm not sure how much reducing the speed limit is going to help as far as turning left on the May from, from 45 to 40. I mean, it's, there may be some other solutions we need to look at uh, because, I mean, this is quite a bit of uh, mileage that's going to affect a lot of people if we do right. reduce it. And I, I recognize that, and when I had first uh, made the presentation to Mr. Chai, uh, it was basically just for the one mile that was between 104th and 119th, and he pointed out to me, and I could see the, the logic of it immediately, that you don't want to have 45 down to 40, up to 45, down to 40. You know, you would just drive people crazy, and they'll just drive whatever they want to drive because they can't remember what the speed limits are. And uh, this is one of, you know, our concerns. But it is not the only concern. Uh, we do have, I mean, really and truly, we do have, and I, I certainly would ask for more uh, police patrol in the area. Uh, that, and I know they have on uh, 119th. I've seen them. I've, I've seen them. Uh, haven't been stopped by them, but I've seen them. And I feel like that that really does help. But I think there is a there is a psychology about I feel comfortable going five miles over the limit but I don't feel comfortable going 10. And so that would be the only thing is, as far as pulling that, uh, you know, the 80th, uh, 85th percentile down, you know, even if it reduces it three miles, that is a, a better reduction than, you know, when it's pushing 50, that's a lot. And we have school buses turning, we have children. I mean, I've seen so many little kids run across from Hunter's Place, which is the addition across the street, to come over to go down to the park, down to the water park. We have that beautiful water park in Early Wine Park. And here are these little kids, and I'm just like, <gasps> and mothers with strollers. I, I nearly have heart failure, you know, when I see them and like, how are you gonna get across this street? And it's, it is a, a bad area. But I know that you can't drop down from the college at 40 miles an hour from 74 to 89, pop up to 45, and then pop back down to 40. I understand that, and that's why I uh, changed that. Did that answer your question? Thank you. Any other questions from this side of the horseshoe? Back over this way, Pam, again. It, when a speed limit is reduced, if this is approved, do we put those um, neon flags, any, anything to bring attention to it, and then is it natural that there's additional enforcement? Well, as far as, um, speed, as, far as the changes go, the, uh, the manual and uniform traffic control devices, it does allow for some high level warning devices, which can be flags, or there's actually a, a, a new sign, which is coincidentally enough named new, and it's basically just a small supplemental plaque that goes above it that helps, um, you know, since it is somewhat out of the ordinary, the uh, manual does allow us to use that on a limited time basis to heighten driver awareness to the fact that there has been a change. Okay, sir. Um, Stuart, on 104th Street, east of Pennsylvania, if we approved this as, as per the motion, as per the application, uh, we would be going back up to 45 as we travel east on 104th. Do you know what the speed limit is on 104th between Penn and, and Western? I mean, are we gonna be going 45, then 40, then back up to 45? It's 45, right. east, of there, east of Penn. But then, I mean, I guess where right, I was I headed is should this be amended to go um, 40 yeah, along uh, you could, 104th? You can act on the things that are on your agenda. You can do less than what's on the agenda, but you can't. We can't, at this point in time, take on another change outside of okay. what's been published and advertised. All right. But it's not like I said, you know, I alluded in the report that it's not, on, it's not beyond reasonable possibility that you'll probably get right. continuing request to uh, expand the limits of 40 throughout the area. Sir? I've got two questions for Stuart and some observations. 
if, if an application like this is approved at traffic, is it then heard again at council, this speed limit application? This or is it final here? This is a final step, unless, okay. unless it's appealed, in which case all appeals are heard by the city council. But if there's no appeal filed, then we issue service Thank requests you. and the signs are changed out. North of um, Southwest 89th, is that 40 miles an hour? Where's my? It is, but you have a lot of driveways, residential driveways coming out onto yeah. May, which would make a, it's quite a bit different than 104th or 119th where you have uh, fenced communities. Dr driveways that are on May. That's correct. Okay. I made, I, I went on a little expedition over the weekend because it was such a beautiful day, which took me two hours. <laughs> Starting at Northwest 63rd in May, I started heading north, and the posted speed limit from Northwest 63rd Street to Northwest 178th Street is 40 mile an hour posted speed limit. At 178th Street, or maybe it's 192nd Street, between 178th and 192nd, then it jumps up to 50 and heads on north from there. 40 miles an hour through that entire corridor. There's one little stretch there that's under construction where it's a posted speed limit of 30. At about, um, I want to say Hefner and North May Avenue. South of, of that, from 63rd to Hefner, there's, there's, a tent, there's actually residential properties that face May Avenue. Lots of little businesses that have these driveways that, that address that. But north of Hefner, we get into that more um, urban neighborhood environment where you have one entrance in a, in a one mile stretch into a large neighborhood with, with big walls. And I was fascinated seeing that. And, uh, and th the difference that, that I observed between what we're looking at today and this trip that I took yesterday was that that portion of North May Avenue is much farther along in development. Not much farther, but it's further along in its development. And I see that this area that we're looking at today headed that way. And I also found it interesting in Ms. Kincaid's letter to Stuart where she mentioned and she just reiterated that her city councilman supports this. And I find those interesting. It, it's, uh, we've talked about the accidents. We've talked about not jumping up from one speed limit, you know, up and down speed limits along the way. That wouldn't happen with this application. Um, it's in staff report that it's probably not cool to go from 40 miles an hour to 50 miles an hour at the very southern end of this boundary, but it happens at the north end of the boundary in the north side of Oklahoma City. And the accident reports, all of the elements that we're looking at today, one of the things that Ms. Kincaid mentioned was the traffic calming. There's a park there. There's people that are walking. And uh, I just wanted to make those comments. Thank you. Okay. Anybody else to talk on this item? Okay, we have a motion from Commissioner Hale to approve item 5A with a second from Commissioner Witcher. May I have your votes, please? Okay, item is approved. Item 5B, Brian Kuhn, PE, who is Zollers, Inc., 2832 West Wilshire Boulevard, Oklahoma City, Oklahoma, 73116 to consider a request to establish 45 degree angle parking on the north side of Northwest 9th Street between North Walker Avenue and North Hudson Avenue. Do you have anybody speak on this one? Yeah, hi, sir. For the record, Brian <laughs> Kuhn with Hewitt Zoller is just representing the applicant. Um, 9th Street between Hudson and Walker, it's right now it's 50 feet curb to curb. Uh, we're requesting put in 45 degree parking, angle parking on the north side. And uh, that block is completely empty right now of buildings on the north side, and the developer's just wanting to create more parking so he can start building some buildings. So answering questions if you have any. Okay. Thank you very much. Sir, can I have staff input? All right. You've got our comments before you. Uh, as, as he mentioned, Northwest 9th Street is, for a, for a street that's classified as a uh, local street, is, is unusually wide. It's like 50 feet from curb to curb. Um, Doing so, or putting in angled parking on the north side, 
uh, we'd still have enough room for like 11 and a half foot lanes in each direction of traffic, allowing for maintain parallel parking on the south side, and then we can introduce a 45 degree angle parking on the north side. Uh, there is only one property that would be if that's got any development on it. It's at the uh, the corner of Ninth and Hudson, and they've got an unused driveway. Uh, the property's owned by St. Anthony's. They've indicated that they have no further use for, or they're not using that driveway. So. You know, that is the only area along this portion of 9th Street where, you know, there might be some question as to whether or not the angle parking should be introduced, but they are agreeable with it. They support the request. Um, staff didn't find anything in the field that would indicate that uh, the request would have any operational issues, so we can support the request as submitted. Thank you very much. Uh, do I have a motion concerning item 5B? Mr. Chairman, I move we accept staff's recommendation and approve the request. Okay, we have a motion from Commissioner Schuline to approve item 5B. Do we have a second? Second. We have a second from Commissioner George. Do we have any talk on this item? Yes. Yes, ma'am. Okay. I just needed some clarification. Uh, I wasn't sure exactly why the change was being corrected, I mean being requested, but I think you said in your presentation that there is building that is going on? Well, there's not any right now. On the north side, there are no buildings at all. And this developer has a lot of properties in the Midtown area. He's wanting to build some buildings there, and he needs to increase some parking. Right now, it's striped temporarily the other way. I don't know if there's been some events down there that someone came in and just kind of striped them for a certain event. Mm -hmm. uh, but there's plenty of room, and it'll, it'll increase the parking count so they can build some more buildings in there. Right. You know, mine was just curiosity. I go down 9th Street, and it's so empty. I that, couldn't figure out why. Right. This is for future buildings. Right. Brian, um, this, the cost of doing this, because, well, maybe I should make sure I know what I'm talking about here. So will the, the curb and everything, the existing curb and sidewalk be demolished? And, and so it's all happening south of that? This is all just striping. It's all just striping. There's okay. no improvements to the curbs or anything. Okay. Okay. Any other talk on this item? We all set, sir? Okay, any other talk on this item? Okay, we have a motion from Commissioner Schuline to approve item 5B, seconded by Commissioner George. May I have your votes, please? Item is approved. Thank you. Yes, sir, thank you for your time. Okay, item 5C, Timothy W. Johnson, PE, Johnson & Associates, Inc., 1 East Sheridan Avenue, Suite 200, Oklahoma City, Oklahoma, 73104 to consider five items. The, re, the removal of an open taxi stand on uh, the west side of Vince Gill Avenue from approximately 36 feet north to 80 feet north of the north curb line of East Sheridan Avenue. The second thing, to remove the, the removal of four two-hour parking, metered parking spaces on the west side of Vince Gill Avenue from approximately 80 feet north 168 feet north of the north curb line of East Sheridan Avenue. The third item, establishment of a passenger loading zone on the west side of Vince Gill Avenue from East Sheridan Avenue from approximately 50 feet to 168 feet north of the north curb line of East Sheridan Avenue. Item four, removal of two two-hour metered parking spaces on the north side of East Sheridan Avenue from approximately 111 feet east to 155 feet east of the east curb line of Vince Gill Avenue with the establishment of an open taxi stand in the same place <coughs> or item five, the removal of two two-hour parking meter two-hour meter parking spaces on the north side of East Sheridan Avenue from approximately 25 feet west to 71 feet west of the west curb line of Vince Gill Avenue with the establishment of an open taxi stand in the same place. Okay, do we have anybody to speak on this? Mr. Johnson, name, address, and you have up to five minutes, please. Good afternoon, Tim Johnson with Johnson & Associates, 1 East Sheridan Avenue, Oklahoma City, Oklahoma. Uh, we're here, I'm here on behalf of the applicant, uh, Mr. Chris Johnson, who is uh, the owner of the building, subject building adjacent to the work we're proposing. Um, 
as you identified, there are multiple items that we're asking for. And it's, this has been an evolution of a project that has been underway for about a year. We've been working with the Bricktown uh, Development uh, Overlay District and have uh, received approval for a uh, certificate of authority to do some construction. And as part of that, we want to make sure that the uh, parking and the uh, drop-off lanes can be uh, constructed at the same time. So as you've discussed, this is the subject building. It used to be Jokers uh, in Bricktown. It's been vacant for quite some time. It's a, it is a very, very well-built building. Uh, and the owner's getting ready to spend a quite a bit of money to do quite a few architectural improvements to the front facade as well as the east facade. As part of the application, we noted that we're asking to remove these two taxi spots that are uh, close to the intersection. And the Vinskill right-of-way is about an 80-foot right-of-way. And so currently there's uh, parallel parking on this side with meters. Uh, we'd like to do away with those meters, the taxi stands, and put this loading and unloading drop-off zone, which will also, we're going to apply to the council to ask for that to be used for valet parking as well. Uh, we anticipate this being a uh, high-end restaurant uh, that will serve the multiple rooms and the hotels that are coming on. Um, as mentioned, the right-of-way is very wide. You can see there's front-end parking in front of Crabtown. Uh, it's, they actually mount the curb and park on uh, gravelly asphalt there, and it's posted for their customers only, although it's not permitted that way. Um, and we're not here to discourage that or do anything to that. Um, as part of the application, then, we would ask then to move the taxi stands to a location here. And I apologize on our exhibit we sent to Stewart. We showed them actually here. And, and we believe that the better location for them would be east of the motorcycle parking, which is right here. Uh, we've talked to the building owners here. Uh, Although they're out of town, I couldn't get a letter by today, but they are in favor of supporting it. Um, so, and the existing Hampton Inn, the proposed new hotel that's under construction. Um, so that's kind of our application in a nutshell. I did have the opportunity to talk prior to the meeting with a representative for the cab companies, and uh, he expressed some concern about uh, locating the cabs, uh, taxi locations here because of uh, some of the uh, street closures that go on late at night in the Bricktown area. I think that's more of a police issue. Uh, we did speak to uh, Captain Don Martin. Uh, it was back in early January uh, and talked about this relocation. He was supportive. Uh, and, and also was supportive of the drop-off lane here at the time. So um, with that, I'd be happy to answer any questions you have. Well, sorry, I just have one before we, we move on. You were talking two different locations, possible item four and five for taxi stands. Which one is that one? Actually, the one we proposed was right here, which we'd like to move further east. Which was item uh, four? Yeah. Okay. And, we, and we do not item, okay. support this because there's a... Uh, commercial loading unloading zone there and there's one metered space there but the building adjacent to us is a very active building and he is opposed to losing that as a commercial loading zone there so in your application here there was two spots for the cab for the taxi stand. right we're proposing that that be that one which here. is item five actually that that location isn't described and i think jill has got a comment on that Okay, go ahead, ma'am. Yeah, since it's not on the agenda for that location that they're proposing now, I'd recommend that we defer that to next month since the location listed here is uh, slightly to the west. Because we moved it east. Mm -hmm. right. And then item four was the one on the other side of Friends Guild? Right. Well, no, four, item four was five, here. part five was the one that was directly in front of the building where he's, he's illustrating it. Oh, okay, it. got it. And part four of the request was the one that was... Right there. right where he's pointing right now. And the location he's illustrating, or he's got marked up there is, uh, I guess, where you 
where it was originally intended, but it yeah. wasn't submitted like that, it, so we, we don't, have a, it that far. We don't we have a description of it like that in the agenda, so it's not anything you can take action on. It was so, always our intent to have it here, but in our exhibit we sent him, it got drawn on the wrong side of the motorcycle. It was on the front part, mm -hmm. and that's not where you really want it. Right, and we have, like I said, we have support from these building owners here. We, we did not approach this building owner. And then you think that that's, that's enough of a change that we need to since it's not the location that's described in the agenda, okay. I, would, I would just defer it until next month. Okay. Uh, can we defer the whole thing or just drop off item four and five? Uh, you could just drop off item four and five. Just choose to defer those okay. items. Would you be okay to yes, proceed on with one, that. two, and three, so that way you can proceed on with the building and be and understand that, and then the actual location of the taxi stand come up next, next month? Yes, we'd be happy to do that. Okay. Just to... Uh, Go ahead. Let me go ahead and uh, I, I just want to make sure on the taxi stands. Oh, now, sorry. Now, okay. um, we probably wouldn't want to remove the taxi stands. Because it's mentioned. Because if we remove it today and we don't establish the new one until next month, ah, that could the taxis wouldn't have a place to, to stand. I think it all impacts. I think we'll have to continue. The so what it's, what it's looking like is uh, parts two and three are independent enough and they, because that's removal of some of the metered parking spaces, which would enable the establishment of the passenger loading zone. Part one is removal of the taxi stand with, with um, its future re relocation to go to when this item was originally written, that the location described in part four or part five, what he's proposing is part six or what would be part six on this. So I think that, um, it looks like that you, you'd be available or you can take action on parts two and three at this meeting and then defer on what would be part one in favor of a new location at the next meeting or if time is not, of not a, you know, that critical, it could all go to the next meeting. It's kind of. Um, we'd like to way. go ahead and get two and three approved simply because we want to submit the paving plans to Public Works for their approval, which is, again, that's another process. So. Okay. Are we okay with that? Okay, so we're good on two and three. Okay, so uh, to modify what I read earlier, uh, where item 5C now only includes subparts two and three. And let me reread two which is the removal of four two-hour meter parking spaces on the west side of Vince Gill Avenue from approximately 80 feet north to 168 feet north of the north curve line of East Sheridan Avenue and item number three, establishment of a passenger loading zone on the west side of Vince Gill Avenue from East Sheridan Avenue from approximately 50 feet to 168 feet north of the north curve line of East Sheridan Avenue. We heard from you that you're fine with just going with those two items yes, sir. right now, and you'll come back next month with the re, with the removal of the taxi stand to a, a to that location that you're talking about. Correct. Okay. As long as the municipal councilor and Mr. Secretary are okay with that, and they'll come back. Okay. One moment. Yeah, I'm just Um, if we establish three as a passenger loading zone and it overlaps with the existing taxi stand on one. Because of that 30 feet overlap? To 80 feet Sorry. north and then it was 50 feet. Functionally speaking, any, any overlap is not, won't be noticed by the public because we wouldn't issue service requests to install the passenger loading signs until plans are approved and the, and the actual passenger loading zone is that area is constructed, so it can, you know, that that cab stand area can continue to remain in service until we get around to moving, you know, at the next meeting, you know, taking an action that relocates it formally. So, and I understand it that way as well. Right, and but but the reason why you want to move on now is because there's another meeting you got to present some information. Not to. necessarily a meeting; it's a it's a process, process, the public works approval process, which will include the approval of a revocable permit. And until we get the plan, this commission to agree that that's okay, we submit the plans and the revocable permit is then approved. Okay. Sam, are we okay now? I would recommend deferral on the whole item. 
Um, that's we'll, we'll agree to that. We don't want to have any confusion on this, so we'd agree to that. Okay. All right, so we have a request from the applicant to defer item 5C. Can I have a motion on that, please? I move that we defer this item until next meeting. Okay, we have a motion from Commissioner Jenkins to defer item 5C to next meeting. I have a second. I'll second. We have a second from Commissioner Witcher. Any talk on this item? I'd like to ask a question. Okay. Tim, you um, you have a written description that describes, uh, I think it was 115 feet east to 155 feet east. Is that description correct? It, does that describe where you actually want the taxi stand to be? Uh, it would not be totally inclusive. Okay. It gets about one of the spaces. Okay. So just to make sure, I want to make sure that it's correct. Right. When we, when we resubmit this item to be considered at next month's meeting, it'll have a different description. It'll be something along the line of probably in the neighborhood of you know, maybe one, almost 200 feet east to, an, to 200 some odd feet further east of that point. That'll describe the new, okay. the taxi stand that he's got illustrated. And you're welcome to send me a, an yeah, updated letter. And that. if you've got a letter of support from that adjacent business right. owner, that'd be I'll great information it. to have in the agenda. Question. Mm -hmm. Just curious, I'd like to learn. When existing taxi stands and parking meters and things like that, um, are being considered to be moved in situations like this, moved around and new ones added, who pays for that? Does the developer pay for that? This, in this application, we would be uh, funding all of the striping and any changes. Not only where the, where the new facilities are going, but where they're being moved to around the corner? Yeah, and I would only stand corrected, depending on the meter removal, obviously the city retains the ownership of the meters. Right, COTPA in this case would be the ones that they'll take care of removing the meter heads. Um, Public Works will take care of removing the posts that the meters are on. There won't be any striping changes needed. And also, also the uh, Public Works will take care of installing the new tax, or they will be relocating the current uh, open taxi stand, stand signs on Vince Gill to that location further east on Sheridan. So it's more a matter of just moving signage. There aren't really curb cuts that need to take place in things Right. Like that. The, the only physical changes that are being proposed is this uh, inset passenger loading zone, but that's, that's, that's all being constructed as part of the remodel for the building at 229 East Sheridan. Thank you, Tim. Okay, and we have one more person that wants to talk on this item. Uh, Carl, if you want to come on up. State your... Uh, name and your address and you have up to five minutes. My name is Carl Gaskins. I live at 1424 Northwest 28th Street in Oklahoma City. Uh, my concern here is the places the cab stand is going to be moved to, the different proposed areas. The uh, section of uh, Sheridan Avenue between Vince Gill and Joe Carter is very commonly uh, blocked uh, restricted traffic flow by the police during the prime hours of Bricktown. Um, if the cab stand is moved to that area, when the uh, street is barricaded for various reasons, uh, we'll lose access to it completely and we won't have a cab stand. Uh, this is the situation we currently have over by Chesapeake Arena. There's a cab stand there on Robinson Avenue facing south. We can never use it during events. It's never accessible to us. It's like no point in even having it. And I'm afraid that may be what happens here in Bricktown. Okay. Sir, if you want to ask first. Sir, specifically, what events are you talking about? I'm new in Bricktown, but uh, I'm familiar with some of the areas, like when the clubs close on Friday and Saturday night. Mm -hmm. I know there are some parades, but all those are very short-term events. Are you talking something in specific that I can check on and get back with for next month's meeting? Okay, well, like in Bricktown right now, uh, at about anywhere from 12 to 1 a.m. All eastbound, is it eastbound? No, all westbound traffic on Sheridan is blocked between Joe Carter and Vince Gill. Uh, they uh, allow only traffic to go westbound. The cab stand is gonna be on that eastbound side or north side of the road to work. Everything's one, or westbound. I get my directions all mixed up here. <laughs> but anyway, on the northbound side, when that barricade goes up over there at Joe Carter to stop that uh, westbound flow, we won't be able to get into the cab stands. Okay, currently. Whereas now you can come down 
We're coming down Vince Gill okay, and Vince Gill. Um, that's the my, uh, main time we use it. Now, it does get used throughout the night uh, in on uh, the mornings because the hotel's there and we're looking directly into the hotel. They can flag us from there and it, it's a good location. But the uh, prime time when it really gets used is when things are really going on in Bricktown, uh, I'd say from 10 p.m. and after, and even more intensely after midnight. And that's when that blockage of Sheridan happens. And even before this construction happened, it was not uncommon at all to have the uh, uh, Sheridan blocked just because of the large number of people in and out of the clubs, and they tend to spill out into the street a little bit, and then just for safety reasons, they're restricting traffic. So I, I'm just concerned that if you do move it there, we're gonna lose access to it. Or, the time when we need it the most. or you can get authorization that the taxis can go through the barricade. Uh, that we've be? had that in the past, but in recent years, it's not been allowed. And the same thing that you talked about at the, at the, at the Chesapeake Arena, if you could get through the barricades to your stand. They're, they're not allowing that currently. Well, that's something that we're just, we maybe look into that. Okay, okay, very good. Does somebody have some other questions over this way? Just to comment that it, it sounds like uh, uh, what Carl yes. is, is speaking of is, is uh, something that's done to uh, uh, make efficient traffic flow that would, on Sheridan, that would shut off the uh, cab stand. So I can understand why that would be an imposition. Um, I know we can't address any other possible locations, but uh, Stuart, are there are there other cab stand locations that might be might get us out of this predicament? Well, in the uh, toward the east side of Br the Bricktown area. Well, uh, something uh, that I think uh, it would have to be. In, in good proximity to uh, the existing hotel and the new hotel. I think that location is pretty important. Um, I can't think of any other place that would, that we could have a cab scan, a stand other than the current one on Vince Gill that wouldn't be subject to this traffic trying to flow out eastbound. But. Well, I think as uh, Captain Wilford mentioned, we'll just have to look at it. Because, I mean, it, it could be a function of, I mean, what Mr. Gaskins has said, you know, if, if in order to promote the orderly, I guess, movement of traffic out of, out of the Bricktown area after, you know, bars and, uh, and other events close down, um, it may be necessary for the police to kind of limit how traffic flows into the area. And if, if say, like, um, like, the, like the location that we're talking about now is westbound on Sheridan, well, at the east end of Bricktown, a west, the westbound movement is actually inbound into Sheridan and then maybe if there may come a point in time where you know in the in the name of public safety the only thing that the city really can do is turn these streets or cut access inbound in favor of trying to move everyone out in which case that would deny them access you know temporary access to being able to get cabs into the stand so we might have to look at um, we'll have to look at it I think more in depth we can do that before the next meeting and if we do lo uh, relocate it another thing to consider is possibly expanding it to maybe three or four spaces because those in that area can be high demand late at night. Uh, the rest of the time, maybe not so much, but. Okay. okay, okay, very good. All right, so we have a motion from Commissioner Jenkins, seconded by Commissioner Witcher to delay this item till next meeting. Can I have your votes, please? All right, that has been moved. All right, thank you, sir. Okay, hey, item 5D, City Manager's Office, to uh, consider a recommendation to the Oklahoma City Council on an ordinance amending Section 56-2 of Division 1 of Article 1 of Chapter 56 of the Oklahoma City Municipal Code 2010 regarding ex exempting vehicles for hire owned and or utilized by nonprofit organizations from the definition of motor vehicle for hire. We have someone to speak on the item. Tracy, if I could have your name and your address, please. And you have up to five, five minutes. Actually, I'm Jane Abraham. I'm community and government affairs manager uh, for the city manager's office. And just presenting some information about the item. Um, I won't I'll try not to get lengthy with my description, but um, 
The organization that is starting up is a new nonprofit. It's called Independent Transportation Network of uh, Central Oklahoma. Uh, about three years ago, United Way convened the first senior summit where they brought together um, older individuals to listen to their concerns and what they're seeing in terms of needs in the community. And one of the major issues that came out of that was transportation. Seniors are frustrated with being able to um, get around the community. If they get to the point where they can no longer drive, their access is severely limited in terms of their transportation options. Um, this organization, it's uh, called Independent Transportation Network, or ITN America, was started in uh, Maine, and they have several affiliates throughout the nation. It's a um, nonprofit organization that utilizes volunteers to provide um, rides for seniors and for those with sight disability that are unable to drive themselves. It operates 24 seven. It's a type of subscription service where the riders sign up and fill out information about their situation and the volunteers that provide the rides uh, use their own vehicles and they uh, go through background checks, their vehicles are checked, they go through, um, their driving record is, um, is screened by the nonprofit organization um, and it, the system is heavily dependent on a, um, a software system that's created by ITN America that they had created, which kind of makes sense for our community then to be, I guess, an affiliate or a, a franchise of that national organization. Um, right now, the Oklahoma um, County Medical Society is housing ITN until they kind of get on their feet. They've already received um, several donations from hospitals uh, in Oklahoma City to, um, to start their operations, but that's in a nutshell kind of the, the gist of the organization. One of the things that other organizations throughout the nation have come across is trying to figure out where they fit into the regulatory environment of the city. And we've kind of talked about this and tried to figure out how this would fit and essentially um, determine that the best recommended course of action would be to include them as um, an exempted entity. If it's a nonprofit organization, a 501c3, um, to, to be exempt. Okay, I have a few things. First of all, could you fill out one of these sheets, please? Oh, sure. Right, sure. And, you're, and you're Jane, what was your name? Uh, Jane Abraham. And you're from? The city manager's office. Okay. Okay. And Tracy is not? Yes. And do you want to speak to, or this is just in case? <laughs> well, if you, if you want to, because you're up here. <laughs> okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sure. Have your and name and your address. You my name is Tracy on. Sennett. I am uh, representing the Oklahoma County Medical Society. The address is 313 Northeast 50th Street in Oklahoma City. Um, most of you probably have an elderly parent, an elderly member of your family somewhere who shouldn't be driving, but is still driving. I know we had that in my family. My dad is almost 88. Um, at one point, we became concerned for his safety and for the safety of other people who were on the road when he was on the road and sat down to have the conversation with him to say, we've got to take your keys away. And his response was, how am I going to get around? How will I get to the pharmacy? How will I get to the grocery store? How will I go visit my wife, my stepmother, who was in an Alzheimer's unit in a nursing home? He needed to be able to go see her. He had no way to get there. All of his children either don't live here or they're all at work. It's very difficult for him to get around. He just felt like it was almost the end of his life as an independent adult. It's very demeaning. So this transportation service was developed to help address that issue, to help give senior citizens who have no other viable alternatives an alternative to get them off the roads so the roads will be much safer they will be safer. Um, they'll also be a more, a better member of the community. They'll be able to go shopping. They'll be able to go have their hair done. They'll be able to go visit their grandchildren. Um, as you know, seniors who are, um, can't get around tend to be isolated. They tend to be depressed. And it's very difficult for them to participate in the community without having some way to get around. This service provides 
like Jane said, 24 seven service, they also can go anywhere they wanna go. They can go anywhere within the service area. So there are no restrictions. They don't have to answer to anybody and explain where they're going. They don't have to call their uh, you know, son and say, I don't wanna be a burden. Could you take me to my doctor's appointment? So another thing my dad said, how am I gonna get to my doctor's appointments? I wanna get to the pharmacy. It's really, it's a huge issue for seniors. So uh, this is a national program. It was started in Maine by a woman whose uh, young son was hit by an elderly driver who should not have been driving. And she uh, turned that anger into this program that she has been working on since 1994. Um, it is, it brings transportation to seniors who couldn't, shouldn't be driving and also the visually impaired um, it is a membership organization. It's not meant for the homeless. It's not meant for the disabled. It is serving a different population that really doesn't get served in a lot of ways. Um, again, they can go anywhere they wanna go. It is mainly driven by volunteers in their own vehicles. What the volunteers get back is that they can bank their own mileage hours. They will have their own account. They can put that in there and then they will have an account once they're ready to give up the keys. So they also can donate their car. If you have somebody who says, yeah, I'm ready to do it, they can donate their car. It's an instant, it's an instant account right there. So um, I have had the pleasure of going up to Maine to their retreat. There are 22 of these affiliates right now around the country, and I think five or six more who are just getting started like we are. We're very close to getting started. Um, this was started by the County Medical Society by physicians who recognized that seniors who cannot get to their doctor's appointments are less healthy. They can't get there, so they can't take advantage of their doctor. If you have a senior who's in the hospital, um, they may need to be discharged at six o'clock in the morning, but if there's nobody there to take them home, they may just stay there until somebody can get off work or somebody can drive into town to come get them to take them home. So the hospitals very, very quickly, and all the physicians quickly recognized that this would be um, very, very beneficial from a, from a physical health and from a mental health stand, uh, standpoint. Pam, um, Pam, if I could ask you to summarize. Close. Um, Thank you. That's it, I think our streets will be much safer. I think that our communities will be uh, more vibrant because of the participation of our seniors in more things. Um, and there is no public funding that will be needed for this program. It is funded by uh, accounts and by donations. Very good. That's it. Thank you, ma'am. Okay. Sir, may I have staff in, please? Uh, we've got the comments before you. Action on this particular request will be at the discretion of the commission. Okay, do we have a motion concerning item 5D? Motion to approve. We have a, a motion from Commissioner Newton to approve item 5D. A second. And we have a second from Commissioner Witcher to approve item 5D. Do we have any talk on this item? I'd like to, uh, I guess, staff and council, that what is the, uh, what's kind of the legal basis for us, for this commission, uh, having any kind of jurisdiction whatsoever over, over this? What, why, why does this come before us? They technically fall under the definition of vehicle for hire as it stands right now, um, which the commission has um, authority over the vehicle Would, for hire ordinances. It, I may not have caught this. Is there, the people who uh, use this service, do they pay for it other than the possibility? Yes, uh, they will put in uh, donations or put in money into their account, okay. and anybody or anybody can put money into their account. Their adult children very often uh, put money into their account. So there is money there. We also receive donations. Now when they drive, there's no money that changes hands, but um, because it's all done by an account. Okay, thank you. Uh, Ma'am, there's a few things I have. One of the things you mentioned was membership. So when they create an account, they're a member. So I couldn't just call up and say, come and get me, no. unless I'm a member. No, you have to be a member and go through the application form. Okay, that leads me to my next thing of, is there a proof of financial need necessary, no. or could I no. have 
a billion dollars and still sign up and use this service? Um, yes, you could. Okay. Hopefully, if you had a million dollars, you would be volunteering. Well, yes, <laughs> but, but if I couldn't drive or something, and right. I, I, anybody can use it as long as they right. become a member and go through the application process. And they have to be ambulatory. We don't okay. uh, have the, uh, usually the vehicles for wheelchairs and things like that, but if you're yeah. on a walker, have oxygen, things like that, we can take that. Okay. Uh, there's two points I'd like to bring up to, the, uh, to all of us is, uh, first of all, uh, uh, we already have a service that does this. It's the taxi services. I mean, you just call up and you get a taxi. They're all 24-7, uh, and you just pay a fee. Uh, the second thing is uh, we have a responsibility to the whole public for public safety, which our certification and inspections and all that kind of stuff happen. And, by, and if we were to allow this to occur as a non-for-profit, which would be outside of our realm if we send this on to the city council, uh, then, as she stated, they have their own inspection criteria, they have their own certification of drivers, driving record checks, and all that, which, is at, which would be outside of our norm. So, as, as we just heard the talk and a couple questions that I asked, there would be no different from a person calling a taxi, which is through our certification, to come get them to take them to all these things. So I want to throw that out as I read this. Uh, and for all of us to just think about, is this in the best public interest to have this kind of service outside of our certification realm uh, when we already have this being done by several cab companies who do it uh, hopefully very well? So I, I just wanted to Can have I something to say to on that? that. Yes, please. Um, typically, uh, they found in the other affiliates around the country that the cost ended up being about half of what a taxi cab would cost. It's also developed around uh, these riders don't ride in shuttles, they don't ride in vans, uh, they ride in the front seat with the driver. It's either it's just them and the driver. One thing with elderly seniors is that getting on a van or a shuttle can be very intimidating. You're on there with a lot of people. You have to stop at a lot of different places, um, and they don't like that. So this would be a lower cost. It would be available to, um, to those folks who need it. And it might also, we did do a uh, look at the other transportation services that are around. Um, of course, there are taxi services. Um, there are also a number of services that are focused on the disabled that will go maybe one place at one time during the day. They tend to be fairly limited. This would be open to anybody. Um, again, at a lower cost in a much more friendly environment uh, for these folks to get in, they're gonna know who their writer is. And um, I think that they're much more comfortable with it. They, the, uh, they do customer satisfaction surveys at every affiliate uh, a lot, and they have a, about a 98% customer satisfaction rate. Um, people like to have that kind of a service. It's very personal. Very good, thank you, ma'am. Uh, there's two more points I just want to throw up. One is she mentioned there's no handicap service, whereas our taxis do provide that service. Uh, and the second thing is uh, our, uh, our cab drivers pride themselves in doing good business and giving cards and for that re that, that re repeat service that they're a good driver, the person likes them, they actually call for that cab to come get them at certain times. Uh, these talks is what we've had over the last four or five years about why we have taxis and why we certify them. So I just wanted to throw that out to everybody, uh, some of the thoughts that I see on it. Uh, I'm sorry. Does somebody over here have something that they wish to say? I thought I heard something. Uh, you, ma'am? Uh -huh. no, I was just going to ask the difference between your service and say RSVP. Yes, um, actually um, RSVP is one of those limited transportation services. It, of, it offers services to specific people. Um, so we actually have developed a list of uh, a lot of the other transportation services. And what we also did very early on was bring together what we called a working group, uh, which brought together people like RSVP, Beth Patterson at RSVP. We have Christy Jernigan with the Oklahoma County Social Services Department. We have the United Way. 
Um, we have Sunbeam on there, and we, that was brought together specifically to walk through these concerns to make sure we're not stepping on anybody's toes. We don't want to duplicate any services. We wanted to be sure that this was a very different kind of a service. And uh, this program, as Jane will attest, who's also been on the working group, has been very, very positive um, among all of those people. So, this was not to take away. We also, what, one thing that we wanted to make sure is that uh, not just taking, not just uh, stepping on other people's toes, but the feeling very strongly, I think, around the table was that there is plenty of this need to go around. This is not something that is just, you know, a little bit here, a little bit there, that it is very, very widespread. It is very, very needed, and there is plenty of room for all of us here. Yes, sir. Um, you, you mentioned their chapters. Is that how you describe them? I call them affiliates. Affiliates. Mm -hmm. And there are how many? You said like 20 around there? There are 22. You can go out to their website if you want and look at the program. It's itnamerica.org. Typically, what's the typical inventory number of vehicles in each one of those chapters? Um, there's very few inventory. That most of the driving is done by volunteers with their own. How cars. many? How many would you say there would be? Like I, like in Oklahoma City, would there be five thousand of them, or would there oh no, be fifty oh no. of them, or twenty-five? Oh no. I mean, of course, it depends on your funding. The more funding you have, the more you can kind of ramp things up, um, so that you can have more volunteers doing your driving. The way that the software was built, it was built specifically for this program, and it is supported by IT in America is to uh, match up the correct volunteer with the correct rider, depending on their geography and where they need to go, so that it's the most efficient, cost-effective way that we can possibly go. Would you, would you have a number of I, just pick, it, pick one of those 20 affiliates, and how many volunteers, drivers, would you say there might be in one affiliate? Well, they're all growing. <laughs> they're growing. Okay. Uh, well, that's yes. okay. It's not a trick question. I'm just. I would anticipate that ours would have no more than maybe two or three of our own vehicles. Okay, and it's then, a small number. And then there's a, an, an inventory of people that volunteer. Yes. As well, and what would you guess that might be? It uh, it all depends on your volunteers. Okay. Um, I don't know quite how to answer that. As we, we we could start off with ten volunteer drivers, but it's going to grow very quickly okay. based on what the other affiliates have experienced. Thank you. I appreciate it. Yes, ma'am. In the other affiliate areas, do you have any idea what the taxi response has been to bringing the service into the area? Because um, it seems to me really the one of the key differences is there's not an exchange of funds right. at, during the visit. I, the um, I did not hear anything along those lines at the retreat that I was at in the fall. It, it just did not come up. That doesn't mean it wasn't there. Um, so, but again, um, we wanted to be sure that we were serving a population that needs to be served. Um, that it was going to be um, good for the community. It's going to be good for um, the seniors themselves, for their families. Um, and we felt like this was a very good program to bring in. Again, the, all the other affiliates have had uh, very good successes and have been um, very positively received in their communities. Do, I, can you speak a little bit about um, how, how to... The, the volunteer nature of this, mm -hmm. although is, I love the idea, also slightly concerns me a little. What, what is the, um, the litmus test for getting a volunteer driver? What's the <laughs> substance abuse policy? What's the well, there are, car safety mm -hmm. measures? Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, I mean, yeah. Can that, is that something that can be brought back? Because mm -hmm. that's, you know, well gone through on the vehicle for hire. We do have a very extensive, uh, we sign a contract with ITN America that specifies quite a number of things, and one of them obviously is insurance that the, that the drivers have to have and that we have to have as an organization. Um, so I don't have that list here with me, but it does cover a lot of that. It also requires us to do background checks on every driver, to do uh, obviously vehicle driving tests on every driver, 
Uh, they have to have insurance on their car. Their car has to be inspected to make sure it's working properly. Um, all those things are built into our contract that are required. And they are not paid a wage. They are just reimbursed mileage. What's in it? They for the can for the driver. They actually can get reimbursed for their mileage, but um, again, nationwide, uh, the vast majority of them uh, bank their hours and either save it for themselves or they give it to somebody else. So, like, if, if if I was to drive for ten years, whatever mileage and time I put in would get banked for when I can't drive, I could call and get the drive-in service exactly. for X amount of time and yes. it just works off of my account. Mm -hmm. Yes. You also can donate to any other affiliate around the country. The founder, Catherine Freund, um, donates her miles to her mother's uh, affiliate, which I think is in Cincinnati. She's in Portland, Maine, because that's just where she would like for it to go. Okay. Anybody else have some questions? Yes, sir. I just, um, the, the um, language that we already have in the ordinance um, exempts vehicles used for ride sharing and carpooling when the seating capacity of the motor vehicle used does not exceed 15. And that's, um, for me, it seems like that applies to this so that we already have some language, but it, it's obviously geared towards churches and, you know, with the, this type of volunteer activity. Um, so the, um, I think we, we already in our ordinance rely on things that are outside of our ability to certify, uh, such as you described with the taxi. Well, except for the fact that anybody could call in. We're usually a church or something of that nature. It's for their own membership. Well, of course, they're calling it a membership. Right. That's... That I, I think we're in the same place as, as with a church because typically a church is um, going to be uh, using a carpooling service or a van or something, a 15-passenger van for their membership, which I think is, from an ordinance standpoint, really similar to this. Except that it's a little bit for hire with some sort of trade-off. Of I've, got a, I've got a pledge to my church. So. No, that's easy. <laughs> okay, uh, yes, ma'am. I was just going to say my the reason for my asking about RSVP because there is the similarity mm -hmm. in that it is private nonprofit, yes. and it's the 501c, mm -hmm. and volunteers uh, provide the service mm -hmm. and are not reimbursed. Right, right. But, that's actually, again, we wanted to make sure that we had the right people at the table as we were walking through this service. We did not want to feel like either that we were stepping on their toes from a service standpoint or from a volunteer standpoint. Um, so uh, that was the reason to bring them together and they talked it through and um, they're ready to go. This group is ready to go. Okay, any other talk on this item? Okay, we have a motion from Commissioner Newton to approve item 5D, seconded by Commissioner Witcher. Hey, oh, stand by. Stand. Thank Did you want to come up and talk? Okay, uh, let me have your name and your address again, please. My name is Pearl Gaskins. I live at 1424 Northwest 28th Street. I just wanted to say I didn't come here specifically for this, but it, um, the service as she describes it, I don't really see where that could be any of threat to the cab business or uh, competition that would affect us in any way. I uh, just would give my support publicly for that. All right. Thank you very much. Okay. So let uh, me say again now, uh, item 5D, we have a motion to approve from Commissioner Newton, seconded by Commissioner Witcher. May I have your votes, please? Item is approved. Okay. Item six, comments from citizens. Anything else? Anybody else out there? Okay, uh, item seven, reports from commissioners. Commissioner Witcher, you got anything? Um, nothing specific to, to my ward. I uh, probably will discuss with Stuart. I just noticed on the way over here a, a parking sign that looked like it was blowing dangerously in the wind on Sheridan. And I'll tell you where that is. Okay. Commissioner Littlefield. As always. Of course. Thank you. Wouldn't be a meeting without you. 
You all uh, received an email from me of a CC of a letter that I sent to Director Russell Klaus, the planning department. And uh, the response that I got from him was awesome. And uh, he asked me if I would be willing to, in a very informal way, survey the folks on the commission and, and for just and, and anything in general. And I'm working on a survey that I'm going to have prepared tonight that I will email you folks. Uh, just questions of where you think the Planning Commission and the Traffic Commission could work together, uh, things that we deal with in here and how that relationship can improve that for the city and for the applicants and for the developers, et cetera. Uh, it's getting some really good, really, really, really good, um, enthusiastic, yeah, let's go for it. I uh, emailed our chairman, uh, gave him a heads up of what I was up to and the proper protocol to go about proceeding with that. He gave me very good instruction. Out of courtesy, um, I contacted the chairman at the Planning Commission, John Yokel, with the same and the very enthusiastic, yes, let's go for it, response from him. So uh, Russell has asked to meet with me this Friday, I think around noon, to take a, a collective set of just comments from you folks that I'll, that I'll be emailing you that tonight. In, Totally, totally separate, but in a unique, bizarre way, kind of connected. Um, in Ward 2, you'll recall a year or so ago, I was discussing the closure of Northwest 58th Street at the Classen Curve, which is uh, west off of Western Avenue, uh, up in the Chesapeake uh, City area. Uh, the neighborhoods, Brookhaven neighborhood and Meadowbrook Acres neighborhood, worked with the Planning Commission and worked uh, with traffic and public works and the applicant to try to figure out before that even went to the Planning Commission what elements could be considered to, to help with the traffic consequences when that street gets closed. And really good things came about it. Ironically, there was a, a bond a streetscape project in that area on Western Avenue where some things were even incorporated into that to help solve the problem. Things never work perfectly in life. The street got closed last week before the elements could be put into place. But the difference is that the elements are there. Uh, one of the elements in, in that uh, trying to help with the consequences of the closure of the street is a no right on red uh, that staff is going to be submitting before us to look at, I would guess, it could very easily be our next hearing, uh, to try to, to um, stop traffic southbound on Western Avenue from Grand Boulevard with synchronizing the light there so that it gives the folks on 56th Street and, and a few streets down a break where we, they can get in and out safely. So that's it from me. Thanks. Yes, sir. Sir. Nothing here, sir. Very good. Ma'am? Sir? Nothing to report. I talked loud enough. <laughs> I, I mentioned last month about Grand Boulevard, and uh, I don't know what happened, but I was informed that the sign has come down. They had for sale signs. But I think a meeting with the Planning Commission would be real helpful because people have asked me things that really are not true in traffic, but uh, they do impact. The community and the flow of transportation. Thank you, ma'am. Sir? Um, no, nothing really to report. I, I, I would just um, love the ideas Rob um, is coming up with and helping bring us together with these things. I want to make sure, though, that um, that any correspondence, I know that there's, there's sometimes issues with emailing between commissioners on Open Meeting Act regulation so I, I'd make sure that it with before you start sending things to everybody um, I'm not I'm not sure if they would fall into this category or not it might be something to have to go on an agenda or something I just don't want to get us get in trouble get you in trouble <laughs> and, if, and in fact if you could just summarize real quick something yeah let me it. research the exact rules regarding emails because if you're emailing the whole commission then it would be a quorum basically it would be a meeting and you'd have to post it so let me research a little bit more and I'll report that to Russell when I meet him on Friday. 
And I'm not you know, totally convinced that that's what he was looking for by this Friday's meeting. But to give clarity to the effort, it said it, it would be just a survey that polls how a relationship between the traffic commissioners and the planning commissioners could be beneficial. And it would be basically a, in a survey form. Well, it, well, I think what the issue is on, on the Open Meetings Act and what she's going to provide us counsel on is just the fact of sending something to all yes. of us at one time makes it a meeting, could become a meeting. Whereas, like, Stewart sends out the notice of the agenda. All he's doing is notifying us to go to a spot that's an open item, which is different than if he was to send something to us all saying, hey, everybody, look, look left here at the same time. We want to do this right, absolutely. So as far as him going, talking, him talking to me, that's fine if he's asking for my, you know, I've been on here for five years now, what's, what's my counsel, that's fine. But once it starts going to the whole area, then it becomes a, a, a concern. And for this body, if five people are getting together and discussing traffic commission business, that would be a meeting. Mm -hmm. Okay. And I understand that completely. Thanks. Okay. Please guide me. All right, and then just before we press on to the staff, does anybody have any input on the vehicle for hire, uh, the formation of the Chapter 56 vehicle for hire? Let's talk about that one real quick. Yeah, I, I sent out an email um, last week to the three that are on the subcommittee. Mm -hmm. um, it's still under review in my office. Mm -hmm. The attorneys are um, giving me their input. Um, so as soon as I get all that, I'll get the comments together. Okay. Um, on a but, draft. but you went ahead and sent out a first contact to everybody. Yes. Good. Okay. Then let's go on to the next one, the record service one. Uh, we received uh, proposals from all the four companies that hold current contracts with the city for pro for providing record services. Nothing ra nothing radically different has been proposed um, by any of the record companies. So at this point in time, we'll probably be looking at submitting a recommendation to the commission next month, as far as a uh, recommendation on from the commission to go to the city council as far as the award of contracts. Okay, so you don't think any, the, the uh, subcommittee will have to meet or anything? Uh, I've, I've got information I can make available to the subcommittee. Okay, However, sure. with, you know, you've got, and basically the four companies that have been providing this service for the past decade or so, applying for the same zones. Mm -hmm. There's not, there's not a lot of, yeah, there's not a lot of need. There's, no, there's nothing that you'll go through at like a deep discernment process on. Because, right. I mean, you're looking at the same people desiring to do, provide the same services in the same zones again. Okay, very good. Ma'am, do you have anything for the... Okay, Captain? No. All right. Wish you luck as you start down sure. at uh, Bricktown. Okay. And, I, and I'm glad we gave you some work to do. Well, yeah, but that, well, that one thing you have to I do. I think right? I know the answer already, <laughs> so I'll, I'll double check. Mr. Chai, anything? No, we have no report for this month. All right, can I take a, can I have a motion to adjourn? I move that we adjourn. We have a motion to adjourn from Commissioner Witcher, a second from Commissioner Hale. All, uh, anybody want to talk about it? Nope. All right, let's vote. All right, we're out of here. Thank you all.